The man from Moscow is painting in the forest. Rain weeps down from cloud and spruce. Before him, salmon spun in a crystal stream. Up high, an eagle waits, as if listening for the sound of chainsaws. The man knows he must capture the beauty here before the forest is cut away. Nearby, a man from Holland moves through a sea the color of sorrel. The water is still. Gulls wheel like scattered thoughts. The nets are nearly empty. The man sketches the salmon before they're gone, and the fisherman before he is driven forever from the sea. The artist from Spain glides through the waters of Lost Creek. His companion is an Eac Athabasca. They move through the grass at the water's edge, committing the land to memory before the poisons come and the land is lost to the Athabascans and to the world. They gathered in an old cannery in the remote Alaskan seaside town of Cordova. Vadim Gorbatov, Pete Klasa, Juan Varela Simo, and the others. Andrew Haslin and David Bennett came from England. Dylan Lewis from South Africa. David Barker from New Zealand. Tony Angel, Andrea Rich, David Rosenthal, and Jen Ann Kirchmeyer from the United States. Photographers Pat and Rosemary Keel from Canada. They came to fight for the survival of one of the world's last wild and natural lands. The weapon they wield is their art. And this will be the last. He says, yeah, yeah. If they can capture the beauty of this magic land, make people aware of its peril, possibly they can defeat the forces that threaten to destroy it. Hold it. What I'm looking for is a crow's feet on your eye, actually. A little more. Being that you're really Each of the artists is a veteran of the environmental wars. Okay. All are members of the Artists for Nature Foundation, this Dutch-based organization of some 100 artists from around the world, have worked to save threatened natural areas in France, Spain, Poland, Ireland, and the North Sea. Their films art books, workshops, and exhibits have focused public attention on these endangered lands. Their art has inspired advocacy and has changed public policy toward the sustainable use of natural resources, has eased development pressures upon the environment. Now the artists have come to an old cannery at the mouth of the Copper River to renew their effort to save the beauty that has inspired their art. The town of Cordova seems suspended somewhere between nature and art. In certain light, it might be painted there, with its old angular wharfs and weathered canneries and pastel houses climbing upon the shoulders of the harbor. Beyond, the bold strokes of white-robed mountains rise, and always in the foreground are the shifting patterns of the living sea. Beyond Cordova, beyond the cannery and the harbor, between the mountains and the sea, is a place as wild and primeval as any on earth. A land of astonishing beauty, as if this was God's original idea of how the earth should be. Nearly a million wilderness acres teeming with life. 
Here is the largest concentration of migrating shorebirds in the world. The delta is home to the eagle, the moose, and bear. The surrounding sea and bays abound with halibut and salmon, sea otters, sea lions, and whales. It's a landscape that appears today, much as it must have appeared when the Eak Athabascans and Yupik Eskimo and the Aleuts first came this way. Widely scattered communities of their descendants remain, continuing the subsistence lifestyle their ancestors lived thousands of years ago. But the outside world is pressing in on the resource-rich delta. Drilling for oil is pending, development that threatens to pollute the delta as it has so often polluted other fragile habitats. Lumber companies are clear-cutting the forest with disastrous impact on salmon spawning streams. A highway across the wetlands is envisioned with hotels and tourist facilities soon to follow. Haul roads from highway to mine sites and lumber camps and oil fields are planned. If these plans are not halted or restricted, the environmental treasures of the delta will be plundered. The wetlands and wildlife will be diminished, and the ancient way of life of the native communities will be destroyed. Leading the group of artists is Ricky Ott, environmental activist, a Cordova resident. Also taking part is Siegfried Voldhek, director of the Netherlands World Wildlife Fund. None of the artists from overseas have been to the Copper River or even to Alaska before. All will interpret what they see and feel in their own medium, their own style. At the heart of the delta, there is a place where people come to renew their ancient connections to the land. I'm proud that uh, my mother was an Aleut. I'm glad to be back where she was born and raised. We have a lot of resources here, and I'd like to see the kids uh, take stewardship of those resources and be able to use them in a sustainable manner and in traditional ways. It is not only the land, but the spirit of the land the artists seek. And the spirit of those who dwelled in this natural place, who walk these shores in times gone by. Our new economy now could be uh, tourism, besides uh, cultural awareness and the spiritual growth of the, the people. The spirit camp is also a symbol of the people's struggle to deal with their changing world. In this new age, how can we find economic alternatives that do not destroy the land, they ask? New forestry techniques, using resources in a sustainable manner. Ecotourism. These are part of the emerging answers. And so the artists go out onto the land and wander the rivers and down to the sea. They open their minds, their hearts, and that magical inner eye that sees a dimension of beauty only they can see, so clearly and so well.
Uh -huh. I think that's got it. That's got it. Toward the end of each day, the artists return to the cannery loft. They examine their journals and sketches and remembered images, and they transpose their impressions into color, line, and form. It is a process old as the first artists who were moved to interpret the world around them on the walls of caves. In the loft of the cannery where fishermen once mended their nets, the artists weave a wondrous world on the loom of truth and imagination. They reach deep into that magic province where their muse resides. And they find there the soul of the land and the sea, and the spirit of the abundant life abiding there. All too soon, this phase of the artist's work is done. The brushes and paints have been put away. The soft mechanics of memory have begun. They gather once more to celebrate what they have seen of this place and its promise. They have seen nature's most compelling expression, and they have made it their own. <laughs> here, here, here. He's proud. He's proud. He's proud. He's proud. Yes. He's proud. You all know that gatherings like this would never happen if we didn't have the inspiration and the push of people like David Grimes and Ricky Off. They celebrate each other and the hidden living world they have come to know. <laughs> now the artists are gone. Back in Moscow and Madrid, Kerry Kerry and Dundee, in Zeist and Salt Spring Island and Seattle, what they have seen and felt, the images of their experience are being refined and expressed. Soon the images will return to America, to Alaska, where they will be enclosed in art books and exhibitions where they will find their way to the consciousness of politicians and policymakers and people like you and me, to the minds and hearts of every American, every Alaskan who believes life, nature's most noble art, should not be sacrificed on the altar of financial or political gain. Cordova is quiet now and the last light of fishing boat ghosts out of the harbor toward the sea. The Delta, its life in the balance, waits. <laughs>